Good evening and welcome to the uh, special symposium in memory of Jim Gordon, who sadly left us on the 21st of June 2013. My name is René Jean Essiamb. I am a researcher at uh, Crawford Hill Laboratory in Bell Labs at Kettle Lucent um, in uh, New Jersey. So this special symposium is to honor Jim's memory, to celebrate his life and his numerous scientific achievements. We just heard from Jim himself about the events that led to the first maser that Charlestown had envisioned. The first operating maser was observed by Jim in December 1953. After having experienced such a great level of success at, at such a young age of 25, Jim went on to make other seminal contributions and pioneer several other fields of research. We will hear today from illustrious science, scientists, many of whom were close colleagues of Jim, on the contribution he made in quantum electronics, quantum optics, quantum communication, laser resonators, laser trapping, and nonlinear fiber optics. We are honored to have such a distinguished panel of speakers today. This is telling of the importance of the scientific legacy of Jim. I've had myself the chance to know Jim for 16 years, and he was a great inspiration to me and all of those who knew him. So we're going to start with the, symp uh, the symposium with the personal recollection from uh, Susie Gordon, uh, Jim's wife of 63 years, and Susanna Gordon, Jim's daughter. So I'm inviting Susie to come to give his presentation. Renee didn't mention that I had worked for Bell Labs, and that's the way I met Jim. Um, actually, I met him in the Whitewater Canoe Club, Jim, as we all know, was in physics, and I was an assembler programmer for the 704 and worked on Unix. Um, Jim would have enjoyed this music tonight. He played the trumpet, and Allison uh, Balson's rendition of Atlanta, Atalanta by Handel was something that he liked. Jim took his last breath on the summer solstice on June 21st, last year. And incidentally, he was born on the spring equinox in 1928. Um, I think I'm supposed to press something. Oh. <laughs> I pressed it and nothing, ah, the, the wrong picture came up. What, what do we do about that? That's the last picture, okay. <laughs> anyway, um, let's see, I already told you where I met Jim. Um, it's been said that behind every great man there's a great woman, and I want to set the record straight because I taught Jim all about quantum electronics. <laughs> and if you believe that, after the symposium, I'd like to sell you a piece of the Golden Gates Bridge, which I have. Um, let's see if I can get this right. That's our family. We have three children, four grandchildren. Sarah, the one, the highest one there, is a licensed architect and is currently employed by, as a web uh, analytical specialist at Time Warner. She also has an architectural license. Uh, Time Warner was just split today, so she's with Time Inc. Susanna, as you heard, oh, I guess you didn't hear. I thought Renee was going to say something about Susanna. <laughs> but Susanna followed her father in physics, making a terawatt laser for a PhD at Berkeley and using it for x-ray research. Jim, uh, my son, our son, is senior vice president of Federated Investors. He went from physics to finance. Uh, Jim, you may be surprised, but I expect you to take care of me in my golden years. Jim, would you please stand up? <laughs> Before I ask Susanna to say a few words about her dad, please bear with me. I'll show you some items from the uh, New York Times. Well, that's kind of a surprise, isn't it? Jim, uh, in 1959, won the Nationals in platform tennis with his partner, Bill Cooper. And they had five match points against them, which was uh, quite a feat to win that game. Now, for those of you who don't know about platform tennis, it's a game that was invented in the Northeast in the 1920s, and it's played outside uh, in the winter. 
and it's a cross between squash and tennis. Uh, the same, well, they were, the New York Times was pleased with this picture because they all had on raccoon coats and they put it in the sports part of the Times. The same raccoon coat giving comfort after the match was he wore. Um, I wasn't going to tell you about this, but I actually used uh, duct tape on the inside to hold it together. <laughs> and he would sit on the front porch and listen to NPR, do crossword puzzles during the winter and I bought him a heated throw. So um, in the New York Times ob obituary, uh, they referred to the raccoon coat and also to a tongue-in-cheek remark that Jim made. Um, when I read it, you'll guess who told them. To quote the New York Times, Dr. Gordon, who won tournaments in platform tennis, liked to wear his raccoon coat sit on the front porch and smoke a meerschaum pipe. One time, his wife, hmm, recalled his hair was must. And she asked him, who do you th heck do you think you are? Do you think you're Einstein? And he said, I'm closer than most people, he answered. <laughs> <laughs> so he put me in my place after teaching him all that quantum electronics. I don't know. So Jim enjoyed listening to Lake Wobegon on public radio. He agreed with the Lake Wobegon effect, defined as a natural human tendency to overestimate one's capabilities. And it's named after the town. The characterization of fictional location where all women are strong, all men are good looking, and all children are above average, has been used to describe a real and pervasive human tendency to overestimate one's achievements and capabilities in the relation to others. However, in the company of many others, he was proud to have had a share in the exciting 20th century advancements in optics, starting with the Maser. How'd I do? <laughs> Thank you. Good evening. I'm Susanna Gordon. Uh, I did pursue a PhD in physics at Berkeley and now work at Sandia National Laboratories in Livermore, California. I live in Oakland. And uh, I now manage a cybersecurity department, so I'm doing something very different, but very much enjoyed my work in physics before that. Uh, so my dad, Jim Gordon, um, was known to me not as a physicist, but as my father at home. And you can see the trumpet playing and, again, the platform, or otherwise known as paddle tennis, playing. Um, more recently, also known as, otherwise known as granddad, uh, the picture on the left is of my brother Jim's children, and on the right are mine, uh, Jeremy and Rebecca, Luke and Alex on the left. Then he had a great time as a granddad. But just like uh, as I was growing up, he never talked about work um, or physics when he was at home. He was uh, just the supportive father you'd hope to have. Um, this is a picture from um, skiing on Lake George. I don't know how many of you have been to Lake George in upstate New York. It's one of the Finger Lakes. We spent time there, mostly in the summer times. This is a wintertime picture, cross-country skiing on the lake. Uh, we had an interesting adventure right after this picture, saving a dog that fell into the water, which was uh, a near plunge for me as well. But uh, I just have about, um, I don't know, 30 or 40 family vacation pictures to share with you that I thought you would enjoy. No, I didn't. Um, but I will, I will uh, share one more. Uh, in, addition to, um, in addition to platform tennis, he was also an amazing tennis player. I don't know how many of you play tennis, but he could not only serve the ball so hard that you could barely return it, he could then spin a serve so that it landed just over the net and took a 90 degree hop to the side. So no matter what you did, you really couldn't win. Um, but one day I, I snapped a shot that I was very proud of, which was a combination when he had been playing tennis and then tried to fix something on a boat. He also enjoyed sailing and had a little bit of a mishap uh, getting on the sailfish <laughs> and ended up uh, as a tennis player in the water um, trying to uh, get the sailfish in shape for a sail. So that was a, that was a fun day. So uh, I, as I mentioned, I live in Oakland, California. Uh, my parents would come for visits periodically, and we were proud to uh, host some dinners that 
that um, some of the guests that you'll be seeing talking in a few moments. Uh, on the left is a picture with Steve Chu, who I think is here tonight, and uh, Charles Towns on the right, who we had a couple of times for dinner. And my husband, Eli Rotenberg, who's there that some of you may know, who's also a physicist. A common sight when I was growing up was my dad at his desk um, doing his physics, and uh, he I had what I call, now call P cubed D, pipe, pad, pencil, and eraser. Uh, he never did without his pink pearl eraser, and he brought his own pencil, so he was a very low-budget physicist for Bell Laboratories. Uh, I think he may have used their lined paper pads um, and occasionally did a simulation, but I think those were just uh, gratis. I don't think he particularly needed them. Uh, but I would look over his shoulder and see a lot of papers like this. Actually, these were, uh, I think, final products where he wrote things up. He rarely wrote things up in... Um, on the computer, he would just write neat copies on lined paper, just like when he was working. And um, it took until, I think, halfway through graduate school before I could look over his shoulder and have some clue about what the heck was on the paper that he was working on. But he really did not talk about his work. It was interesting, uh, after he passed away last year, I had a couple of calls from the press asking me, since I had a physics degree, to discuss with them his work. And I had to say, well, if you, if you want to know about how to weed a lawn, I can tell you all his pointers. But he didn't really give me any pointers in physics. It was not something he talked about at home. That was just something that he did at work. Uh, so on his wall at his office was a framed um, quote that said, there's no limit to what can be accomplished if it doesn't matter who gets the credit. And this is really the way he lived his life. Uh, he, as you'll hear, worked on several projects, many efforts that led to multiple Nobel Prizes, uh, which he did not share, but he was very proud to be a part of those things. He would say that, you know, of all the awards he won, he would say, well, I didn't do much. Um, he would say, um, you know, he was proud of all the people he worked with. He was very happy to have done that and uh, very happy to have made the contributions that he made. Um, but he never felt um, in any way undervalued. He knew that he was an important contributor. Uh, he certainly did win plenty of awards in his time and um, continued to be very humble about it. Um, I, I actually, as I mentioned, I did go into physics. I went into graduate school, and since he didn't talk about his work, was completely naive almost entirely until uh, early in graduate school, I had an experience where I had the opportunity to go to a conference, perhaps, with him, and I was very happy because I had been out in California. I was going to UC Berkeley. It had been a long time. And I thought, great, I'm going to see my dad at a conference. And another graduate school a student actually accused me of name dropping because I was going to see my dad at this conference. And I thought, really? <laughs> oh, that was kind of a grounding experience. I thought, OK, well, I won't mention that again. <laughs> so in any case, uh, he made just an amazing number of valuable contributions and was always very humble. He said, you know, over the years I've grown to learn more and more about less and less and now I know everything about nothing. And he was very proud of it. Thank you.